This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Again, we welcome you to another session of our roundtable discussions on the New Testament. We're discussing in the Four Gospels the last week of the Savior's ministry. With me today are members of the Ancient Scripture Department at Brigham Young University. To my far left is Keith Wilson. Next, Paul Hoskison, Ray Huntington, and I'm Camille Frank. We're looking today at the commencement of the last week of the Savior's mortal ministry. Perhaps one of the most, the most remarkable week in all of history. I won't even say perhaps, it is the most remarkable one. And, and frankly, we have a tremendous amount of information in our scriptures, in the four Gospels, that cover that, that week-long period of time. We can almost tell day by day what is taking place um, during that week. And um, if we're in John chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 21 primarily today, as we begin with Sunday of that week, uh, the Sunday before the crucifixion, um, we see the event called the triumphal entry. What is there as far as significance? This is definitely a different approach, a different way that we've seen the Savior enter into Jerusalem. It's a different reaction than we've seen many times in a public way that he's greeted as he comes into Jerusalem. No, I think, <clears throat> I think that's a good point, uh, Camille. Six months uh, earlier uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, um, his, uh, his brethren, which uh, evidently were his uh, half-brothers, uh, wanted him to go up to Jerusalem uh, openly to the feast. And um, basically he said, uh, you go ahead and go, I'll come up later. And when he did, uh, the text makes it very clear that he went up not openly, but secretly. This, however, is much different. This is a proclamation of who he is, and, and, it, and it is um, a triumphal entry, of, of, of not of sorts, but of magnitude, I think. Uh, let's just read some of the passages to get some feel for what is happening there. Keith, do you want to start reading there with verse 12, 13, 14, 15, in chapter 12 of John? On the next day, much people that were come to the feast. Uh, uh, I'm is that where to you interrupt? Yeah, but what's the next day? What has just happened previously? Just so we fit this in context. Uh, well, uh, the previous uh, events. Uh, immediately, John is really focused on the event of la raising of Lazarus, and so uh, he he links them together there very closely, and he even says part of the big tumult, part of the part of the crowds are coming because they want to see, they've heard of Lazarus, and they want to see Lazarus also. Right. But so, And, and you've, you've had Mary that has anointed his feet. Um, or with, his, the, with the costly. With the costly mm -hmm. ointment. Um, and, <clears throat> um, that little scene where he's talked about, she is doing this in preparation for my burial. So there's the, the, the interest and, and anticipation is becoming very high. Okay, go ahead. On the next day, much people that were came come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. I think that we need to say something there about uh, what, uh, what is being proclaimed by the people here. Hosanna, of course, uh, is uh, the Hebrew phrase for save us, O Jehovah. That is, uh, they're proclaiming that the salvation of the Lord has come. Which and is not a, a, a <clears throat> word or a greeting that would be typically used amongst themselves or even others of, of great repute. Not necessarily, no. Mm -hmm. No. And then, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is a quote, if we, if we look down in your uh, footnotes there. Whoop, it isn't in the footnotes. Hmm. Anyway, it's a quote from uh, <laughs> Psalm 118. If we want to turn back to Psalm 118, verse uh, 26. 
Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So the people are quoting a messianic psalm to introduce his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What's interesting is the rest of the psalm because it's talking about the work of the Lord. So, uh, for instance, in verse 17 of 118, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord, talking about what the Lord does for all of us. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. All of us in life have trials and tribulations, but God will save us uh, mm -hmm. uh, eventually from death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. If anyone has opened the gates of righteousness, it is the Savior through the events of this last week of his mortal life. Uh, verse 21, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Again, talking about the work of the Lord, of saving all people. And then one of the other famous quotes that he uses in the same triumphal week in verse 22, the stone which the builders refused mm -hmm. has become the headstone of the corner. One of the strongest and, and most detailed of the uh, messianic verses in the Old Testament. The Lord is, uh, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. It's not something that man has done, but God has done it. And skipping down to verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Is that the Hosanna in there? That save now, or I beseech thee? Uh -huh. it's, it's the same, it's not the same word, but it's the same root word. Mm -hmm. There, save, save mm -hmm. us now, yes. And then comes the phrase that's quoted, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of and the Hebrew there is Jehovah. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Jehovah, who hath blessed you out of the house of Jehovah. God is Jehovah, which has showed us light. Bring the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Mm -hmm. He's coming in the triumphal entry to make that last sacrifice that is prophesied here in Psalm 118. That is a great cross-reference, isn't it? It, is. it yeah. need, really needs to go along and with And Paul, that. your cross-reference is in the Matthew account. Yes, That's where you I know it was, it, was, it was in one of them. Then in the footnotes. In the Matthew right. 21 footnotes, yes. You know, there is some suggestion, um, I'm, I'm not sure how doctrinal this is, but there is some suggestion that this, that this uh, particular psalm uh, was uh, used um, at different points uh, in, in the temple ceremony, or not the temple ceremony, but during... Uh, times of sacrifice uh, mm -hmm. at the temple. In fact, uh, there's one who suggests that while Zacharias is in the holy place, the first room of the temple, performing his priestly duties, it says that the people were without praying. There's some suggestion that they were uh, using this particular psalm, uh, pleading for this messianic age to come in which they would be saved. Let's skip over to uh, Matthew 21 and pick up the story of riding on, on the donkey, the colt of an ass. It's given a little bit more detail there in Matthew 21, uh, beginning in, uh, in, in verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and went and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. Now the Mount of Olives is, is just east of, the, of Jerusalem, just east of where the temple was standing saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, And then the quote is from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set Jesus thereon. And then they begin the triumphal procession in Matthew at that point. Uh, I, I want to say something about uh, the significance of what's going on here. Uh, when you turn back to Zechariah 9.9 9 and read this in the Hebrew, it's obvious that this is the female donkey has this young male colt uh, that no one has ever ridden mm -hmm. on before. It's never been touched. And Jesus is the first one who's going to ride this young male uh, colt into Jerusalem. The reason for this, uh, I, I think, is twofold. In the ancient Near East, um, it was not uh, considered proper that a king ride on a horse. 
uh, horses were war animals, and a king was not supposed to ride a horse. That's why when Absalom is trying to run away, he grabs He's a mule, a mule. instead of a horse. Yeah. When you think about that, if he really wanted to get away, why didn't he get a horse? Because they're a lot faster. But instead, he has to get the mule because that's the symbol of the kingship and the donkey, too. We actually have a letter of, from one of, the, of, a, of an ancient Near Eastern king's advisors to him saying, it's not seemly to ride on a horse. You must, like all kings, ride on a donkey. Well, I think even at Solomon's, uh, uh, when he was uh, anointed uh, king at the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem, he also rode a donkey. Yes, yeah. yes. These are the animals of royal. David, David said, you give him my royal yeah. donkey, donkey, mule. Yeah. And that's the symbol of that Solomon was to be the new king, not a horse. So is, is the horse then seen more as a, a, as a warring type yeah. animal? Yes, and so the donkey in those days. Is. And so you see the imagery, this is beautiful, isn't it? it as is. he comes in, the prince of peace. Well, the imagery yeah. goes on, and that is the, 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 uh, the Hebrews... The Jews would have recognized this symbol of riding on the donkey as his proclamation of his kingship because of the ancient prophecies and because of the ancient traditions, as Zechariah prophesied. Now, there, uh, Paul, there's also, though, the, the imagery floated around, at least, in some commentaries about the donkey being a domestic animal, so this is a sign of peace. Well, that's, is, is, is that a strong image in your mind, or is it a, is it a dual image? Well, that's the other side of the coin. By the time the, the Greeks conquer the ancient Near East, the symbols begin to change. So beginning with, the, with Alexander's conquest of Jerusalem, the horse becomes the symbol of kingship, but it's not the ancient Near Eastern symbol. Mm -hmm. It is the Hellenistic, the Greek, and the Roman symbol. So that by the time Christ comes along, the Romans looking at this scene would have seen him riding a domestic animal with no pretensions of royalty and no pretensions of kingship because they would have expected him to ride a horse. So here he can come into Jerusalem proclaiming his royalty, riding on this donkey, and the Jews would have recognized exactly what was being said. Without it being considered the, a threat to the Roman and Empire. And the Romans would not have yeah. seen it as any threat mm -hmm. or any challenge to their power. It's one of the most beautiful ways of taking the symbols and using them in the situation here to proclaim his royalty. But, but how many of the Jewish people there in Jerusalem recognized, put that together, and by their very shouting of Hosanna and placing down the palm fronds, recognize, show that they recognize it and acknowledge him as that very, in that very role, right? Yes. Well, let's, let's continue with the imagery, though, yes. the, the symbolism of the signs when they welcome him. Uh, we, have the, we have the donkey and we have the palms and we have the garments uh, or the coats, the things that are strewn out in front of him. Now, uh, then it seems like there's a dual image here, or at least two images are referring to his regal or his kingly status, both yes. the donkey then and the garments. Aren't the garments the, the sign of a royal entrance, people strewing their garments out in front of him? Pad uh, carpeting the path yes. before them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you'd have both those signs there. Yes. And then the palm branches, uh, from which we get the traditional notion of Palm Sunday, the commemoration of uh, this triumphal entry. The palm branches uh, are a sign of, well, let's see, are they the victory? Uh, yeah, the palm branches are the victory sign, aren't they, that they, that they uh, put down before people. At least I think that's something that Talmadge mentions, uh, that the palm branches are a victory sign. So you have a real confluence of kind of imagery here that's, uh, that's uh, the palm, mm -hmm. the garments, the donkey. Uh, the donkey has both two, so you have, and it's quite, it's quite fun to think about all the symbols that are being sent to the people as they watch because uh, here you have the prince of peace coming in victory uh, to reclaim his people. It, it is also reminiscent of a prophecy that John gave in his revelation that in the last days there would be acknowledgement of the Savior as the Redeemer. In Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse 9, and John records, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. I think that this is a, vic a victory in numbers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues stood before the throne and behold the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands um, and crying with a loud voice. 
and he's, they're explained in verse 14, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah. that symbolism is revisited um, in a later prophecy. Well, this is, this is how he commences. The, <laughs> Now, the how, about the, how about the numbers? How, how, how many people came? I mean, there's, there's quite a few. And who are these people? Yeah, and there's quite a few people, or, you know, uh, amounts or just uh, speculation. Any, any take on how many people actually showed up that Passover on this triumphal Sunday? Yeah, I think there's a hint in Matthew chapter 21, when we go over to there, uh, in verse 10. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So clearly, the people who are, are, who are shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, are, are probably his disciples. And they're making a lot of, uh, they're making a big a deal a out of, of coming into the, and a lot of noise. And there's yeah. quite a number of his disciples. And there's disciples. quite a number of them. Well, but uh, but uh, the other people in Jerusalem were asking, who is this yeah. now? You, you look at verse 11 in that same chapter, Matthew mm -hmm. 21, uh, when, when the question is asked, as you just referred to, who is this, in verse 11, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Yes. Uh, and, and you put that on top of what has just happened that we see in John <clears throat> chapter 12, um, verse 17, the people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, that they heard that he had done this miracle. There's been some added excitement and anticipation. Oh, yeah. the, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead after being dead for four days has spread. And they're yeah. saying, who is this? Oh, this is the same one who did this. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting here. Yes. And in fact, what are the, okay, then you've got the Jewish leaders. What are some of the Pharisees saying at the same time? Um, I like to look in... in the Luke account, Luke 19, um, where the Pharisees, as, as they see this multitude of disciples and now many others that are being added to those numbers, uh, verse 39, the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, to Jesus, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Because they recognized that they were quoting those messianic passages and proclaiming him as the Messiah. Uh -huh. And they and what, didn't like that. And what's his response? <laughs> I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. What does he what mean is that, by that? Yeah, what does that mean? I mean, I, you, you read that and you, is that, is, is, it, is it an exaggeration? <laughs> is it uh, a way of stating that someone is going to be here to bear testimony of who I am? Well, I think the evidence is so <clears throat> great, is so clear. All things bear witness of him. You cannot, you cannot hide this. You cannot stifle the witness that is there. Well, I think when you, when you consider where we're at in his ministry, he, he has had three years now of bearing testimony through different means. He's had John the Baptist bearing testimony of him. He's had his apostles, members of the Quorum of the Seventy. His works, which were uh, his, his numerous miracles, all bore testimony of him. Yes. And now yes. it, it's sort of a culmination now of, of um, at this event, that um, that he is who he said he was, and that there has been ample testimony right, right. of of his wow. uh, messiahship. And okay. Well, and and in, and in, uh, to just amend or just add on to what you said, uh, a great statement in John is where the Pharisees then, after they're rebuked. Uh, they, they, they notice their own nothingness, and they, uh, they say, "Perceive ye, John uh, 12 verse 19. Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is yeah. gone after yeah. you." Um, yeah. and, and I love the thoughts. Some, some of the Christian writers really come up with some rather huge numbers of the people that must have been there. Uh, for that triumphal that entry. That makes these Jewish leaders very nervous. That's right. And, and then down in verse 23 then, this is throughout the Gospel of John, how often he has said, mine hour is not yet come. But now he says very clearly in verse 23, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And um, he openly declares, this, this is the time. This is what his entire mission is leading up to. Yes, and remember too that this is the, the feast of, uh, of the unleavened bread. It's the Passover, and 
uh, to this, we have a lot of Jewish people coming from outside of the land of Israel. Yeah. John specifically says there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Greeks Jew, Jews of the diaspora. This doesn't mean uh, Greeks, ethnic Greeks. It means Jews who speak Greek, right. who have right. come up from outside of, uh, of the land of Israel to visit us. They're the ones who don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. They might have been some of the ones who were asking, who is this? Who is this? And then over in 21, uh, in Matthew 21 again, the first thing that he does when he enters the city is to cleanse the temple. And, and what does he say, I think, very clearly in, in contrast to John's gospel account in, in chapter 2 when he cleanses it, where he talks about my father's house. Here in John and Matthew 21, verse 13, he calls it, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. Well, when you, when you think about it, what, what has he just done? He's just proclaimed his kingship. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is the king. This, in a sense, is it's the temple. This is the house. house. This is the palace. The, right. yes. the palace of the king, and, it, and it's being defiled. And all things that go on in that temple, in that house, bear witness of him. Yes, and, and his quote there, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves, again harkens back to the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament from Psalms and Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the people would have understood that again, too, exactly what he was talking about. When what, what do you see happening um, I, I, at, at the temple on the day that it was cleansed? He's, he's talking about he's overthrowing the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. I mean, what's going on? And why is he so angry? Well, I think the word is angry. It's righteous indignation from a king who has uh, the, the right to be um, upset at what's going on in his palace. But what do you see happening there? Well, this is... Uh, uh, no doubt, the outter uh, precinct the court of, of the, 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 not, the, court not of the, the Gentiles. Not the actual sanctuary. No. Not, in the, not in the building and not in the, the Israelite court, but in the court of the Gentiles and the women. They've set up these tables to do business. And the temple there is, that part of the temple grounds are specifically set aside in the Old Testament for non-Israelites to come and worship. And it's been made impossible for these non-Israelites to come and worship there because of the business that's going the on. The clutter. The mm -hmm. clutter, the noise, yeah. the, the irreverence that's going on there. And he's going to clean out his house. Even though, as Elder Talmadge says, he may not have recognized this as being an authentic house of the Lord. He's still going to, right. to adopt the symbolism here. He I'm has right come right. to clean out the house of the Lord and make this a place of worship. Okay, with just a, a few minutes that we have remaining, let's look at one other event that we see um, in this first part of the week, and that is the cursing of the fig tree. Yeah. The Mark account makes it a little more clear that he curses it on one day, and it's the following day they go by and see that it is shriveled. Yes. Um, now, sometimes you look at that and think, oh, this poor little fig tree, <laughs> all he's doing is, you know, doing his best, and he just doesn't produce figs. And so the Lord curses him and think, ah, isn't there some Joseph Smith translation or something that'll say, the Lord would not curse him for that. But I think there is some, some teaching, some symbolism, a message that he's communicating by cursing it. What do you see as being taught by the Lord here in this beginning of the last week of his mortal ministry by cursing the fig tree? You know, the fig <laughs> is in a sense deceptive. In the Middle East, at least in Palestine, the fig, um, uh, uh, fruit comes before the leaves. You get, you get little fruit starting, it's not very big, and then you have leaves such that if you see leaves on a fig tree, you can anticipate that there's fruit. That there's fruit already there. there should, it yes. should be there, and it should be ready to eat. Yet in the text, in, in Mark chapter 11, in verses um, um, 13, 14, 15, it says in verse 13 that he sees the fig tree, and in verse 13, it says, He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he, found, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. In other words, this tree is really messed up. It shouldn't even be there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, 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 um, it's... It gives the appearance. Yeah, there is an appearance here. Um, but that, there's no that fruit. fruit. ought to be there, but it's not there. And so he curses it. Okay, and what does he teach by that? It seems to me that this is a symbol of apostasy. You have all the trappings of the true tree, the house of Israel. It's supposed to have fruit on it. It appears that it has fruit on it. You get up close and there isn't any fruit. So this tree is, is I think, is symbolic of the one that the Savior talks about being cut down. 
John being the last legal administrator, and the tree will now be cut down and, and uh, made room for the gospel. Because fruit. if it doesn't bear fruit, his fruit, it, it does more damage. It can create more problems than it yes. helps. Well, and uh, the apostasy can be even pinpointed a little bit tighter with, uh, with his denunciation that he comes with in the next day or two of hypocrisy. It just seems to be a scaffold right. of what's supposed to right. be there. Yes. It has the appearance, yeah. but not really it, substance. Is there something else, too? He has raised Lazarus from the dead to show that he has power to bring life after death. Well, I, what else is seen here? Is he saying as well, with his, he has power to bring his, when his life comes to a, an end, his mortal life later that week, that they can see he has power to bring death as well. No right. one takes his life yeah. from him, but he lays yes. it down. As he begins this, this last week of his mortal life, for this hour, for this day, for this very mission he came into the world, as he's begun it in these first couple of days, we see a powerful witness from his words, from his actions, and from the reaction of the people around him, his disciples, that this is indeed the Son of God, the Messiah, who has come to save the world. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.